When Nintendo released Paper Mario in 2001, despite it being one of their last major releases for the Nintendo 64, it was still a commercial success and was lauded by critics and fans. It wasn't the most involved role-playing game on the market, especially compared to those developed for Sony's PlayStation, but its simple gameplay and charming aesthetics still appealed to players. As such, a sequel for Nintendo's next console, the GameCube, was basically guaranteed, and in 2004, it came in the form of the Thousand Year Door. It received similar critical praise at its release, and in the years following, it has become a sort of sacred cow for many fans of the series, frequently being cited as the best Paper Mario game ever released. But is that reputation deserved? Today we'll be looking back at a cherished Nintendo classic and try to determine why so many people, myself included, love it so much. This is Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. The early 2000s would bring us two Mario RPG series, Alpha Dream's Mario and Luigi franchise, which began with 2003's Superstar Saga on the Game Boy Advance, and Intelligent Systems' Paper Mario. The two series differ from each other in many ways, though both focus on action-based combat that emphasizes timing and execution as opposed to long-term strategic and class-based gameplay. The Mario and Luigi series would continue to follow in the RPG tradition years after Superstar Saga's release, and after 2004, would be the sole Mario RPG series still in development. Paper Mario, on the other hand, would only produce one more game in the RPG genre before Nintendo and Intelligent Systems began experimenting with more action-adventure gameplay styles. That remaining game, initially titled Paper Mario 2, was first announced at GDC 2003. According to Kenshiro Ueda, a Nintendo developer who coordinates with outside developers on projects, it took a while for him and Intelligent Systems to convince project supervisor and producer Shigeru Miyamoto to move forward with a Paper Mario sequel. The designers wanted to introduce more paper-like elements to the game, making characters behave more like they were flat, flimsy objects, but Miyamoto didn't believe this was enough to make the game innovative. Instead, Intelligent Systems focused on taking advantage of the GameCube hardware, such as being able to display up to 1,000 characters on screen at one time, which was enough for Miyamoto to officially approve the project. The designer still implemented more paper mechanics into the game, like introducing new paper abilities, keeping the arts and crafts inspired art style from the N64 game, and a cut feature where players could draw lines and shapes on pieces of paper. With more advanced 3D modeling capabilities, the character artists and animators could get more creative with animation, splitting up characters into body parts that were animated independently of each other. When designing story segments, humor was emphasized a lot more over Paper Mario, as was creating character arcs that were more emotional. Nintendo Senior Director of Localization, Nate Bildorf, believed this was a result of Nintendo of America's localizers being involved during development rather than after the game was finished. Nintendo showed off the game, now titled The Thousand Year Door, with a playable demo at E3 2004 and released the game on July 22nd in Japan, October 11th in North America, and in November for Europe and Australia. It was acclaimed by both critics and fans, and in the following years, the people who grew up playing it remember it fondly as the last of the halcyon days of the series before it went off in a whole new direction. But it hasn't escaped criticism, especially as the divide between Paper Mario fans grows ever wider and people bring up the game's flaws. As a reminder, this retrospective series isn't about picking sides in that debate. We're here to look back on these games with a critical eye, and though this game was an important part of my childhood, and spoiler alert, I still love it, I want to treat it fairly. With that said, let's now dive into the Thousand Year Door and see if it's deserving of its legendary reputation. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door begins by telling the story of the town of Rogueport, which centuries ago suffered a great calamity, forcing the citizens to rebuild on top of the ruins of the old town. One day, Princess Peach visits Rogueport and meets a salesperson who bestows on them a chest that will only open to one with a pure heart, and as Princess Peach is a noble soul, she opens the chest to find the magical map. According to legends, this map reveals the locations of the Crystal Stars, which, when gathered, will open the Thousand Year Door hidden in the ruins of Old Rogueport, now known as Rogueport Sewers. Peach sends the map to Mario, inviting him to come hunt for the Crystal Stars with her, and thus Mario sets off to join her in Rogueport. When he arrives, however, he finds that Peach has gone missing, and also encounters the x Knots, a villainous group led by Sir Grotus who are also on the search for the Crystal Stars, and are cornering a young research student named Gumbella. 
After saving her from the Exonauts, Goombella takes Mario to see her archaeology professor frankly, and the three journey underneath the city and find the Thousand Year Door. By holding the map up to the door, it alters itself to reveal the location of a crystal star, and with their goal set in their heads, Mario and Goombella set off to recover the crystal stars before the Exonauts can. Meanwhile, Princess Peach wakes up as a prisoner in an x naught base after they capture her, but curiously, the door to her room opens and she is able to explore some of her surroundings. The one who let her loose is Tech, the x naught central computer who is loyal to his creators, but expressed an unknown feeling when seeing Peach for the first time, which Peach realizes is a sign of love. She helps Tech to learn about what love is, as he's unfamiliar with it, and in return, Tech gives Peach information about what the x naughts are planning and lets her send emails to Mario and company. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Bowser and his minions learn about Mario's quest for the Crystal Stars and that someone's kidnapped Peach, and the Koopa King and Kami Koopa set off to grab the treasure before Mario can. They don't know why Mario is searching for the Crystal Stars, but they figure they must be important if Mario's looking for them, and Bowser wants to take Peach from the x naughts and kidnap her himself. The Peach and Bowser sections take place in the intermissions between chapters, and while they provide the player with more context about what's going on, the focus is still largely on Mario, so with the premise out of the way, let's talk about the gameplay. TTYD doesn't stray very far from the formula established in Paper Mario, instead making small adjustments to improve the experience. You're still controlling Mario as a 2D sprite in a 3D world, interacting with characters, traveling to new locations, and battling enemies. Mario still has his trusty jump and hammer from before, though as you might expect, he's lost all the fancy techniques he learned in Paper Mario. Unfortunately, Mario can't spin dash anymore, which I do kinda miss, but it typically isn't a big deal since most areas are condensed enough to the point where getting from one side to the other doesn't take too long. It does, however, become a pain when you have to traverse through levels multiple times, especially because TTYD has a lot more backtracking compared to the N64 game. A lot of chapters require you to go from one end of the level to the other, sometimes more than once, and while it doesn't always take that long, it's still a lot of unnecessary trudging through familiar locations. Some areas allow Mario to interact with objects in the background, with Pipe sending him to the back area of the room, and this isn't used very often, but is typically the key to solving puzzles or opening the way forward. Once again, Mario will find upgrades to the boots and hammer that increase the power of his jump and hammer abilities in combat and provide him with a new overworld maneuver and battle technique. I forgot to mention this in the last video, but in Paper Mario, upgraded boots let Mario do a new type of jump both in and out of battle, and in TTYD, that applies to the hammer as well, with this new spin attack that breaks these giant blocks. In terms of collectibles, there are still plenty of items to collect and badges to equip, both of which function the same as in Paper Mario. However, upgrading your partners now requires you to find these Shine Sprites placed around the world, like the Super Blocks of the last game. You bring these to Merlin so we can upgrade your partners, but you need three in order to do so this time, and you'll want to do that because in addition to increasing their attack power, it also gives them more health. Mario also learns these new paper abilities in the form of curses bestowed upon Mario by these demonic faces residing in black treasure chests. Each curse gives Mario a new movement option that allows him to enter certain areas that are otherwise inaccessible. They don't have any other function, but it is cool seeing this version of Mario actually act like he's made out of paper this time. Plain mode allows Mario to glide through the air to get across horizontal gaps, which is a bit awkward to control since you need to carefully move the control stick left and right to guide it properly. Paper mode turns Mario on his side so he can get through narrow spaces, and later you can transition into tube mode from this ability to get into small corridors with a low ceiling. Finally, boat mode transforms Mario into a paper boat so he can travel through bodies of water, essentially a replacement for Sushi's overworld ability from the last game. I do wish these moves had a use within battles, as I'm a huge fan of when games incorporate their aesthetics into the gameplay mechanics as well, but regardless, these moves are cool even if they have no practical use. Speaking of the battles, these are also mostly unchanged at their core, with most of the differences coming from slight tweaks to already existing functions or adding new functions entirely. Mario and his partner still take turns fighting enemies with their arsenal of moves, items, and special abilities, and even with the new stuff that TTYD adds, it is still a very simple combat system. Just as before, you can use jump and hammer attacks as Mario and use guard to defend against enemy fire, but Mario can also use the super guard to counterattack enemies or block projectiles without taking any damage. Mario and his partner can now defend, which replaces the do nothing command, which is great because you can reduce the damage you take instead of just wasting a turn if you need to halt on attacking. 
That's critical because your partners now have their own HP gauge and are susceptible to status effects, and you can now apply items to them as well. This expands your potential strategies quite a bit, since you need to factor in how much damage your partner can take before they go down, in addition to worrying about Mario, although Mario should always be your top priority because the battle ends in a game over if he falls. Special moves return, although there's a new set of them here, each one given to you when you find a crystal star. They don't activate automatically anymore though, instead you need to perform an action command just like a regular attack, although these are much more involved and require more attention and dexterity. The biggest addition to the battle system, and one that I really like, is the audience. During a fight, there's an audience watching whose members can either help you out, attempt to harm you, or apply a random effect to the combat. What they'll do depends on which type of audience member it is, but most will stick to throwing items at you, which you'll either want to grab or want to avoid by striking the audience member when prompted. They'll also help you regain star power by cheering when you perform action commands or when you appeal to them, which both Mario and his partner can do naturally now. To get a big boost of star power, you can perform stylish moves by doing unprompted action commands during your attack animation. The audience goes wild for stylish moves, but you aren't told when to press the button to pull a stylish move off without the timing tutor badge, and even learning about them will likely happen by accident or by doing outside research because the game doesn't tell you about them via tutorial. The number of audience members fluctuates throughout a fight, as actions in battle will result in members either joining or leaving the stands, and this will affect how much star power you gain. Your maximum audience capacity will grow as you upgrade the stage, which happens after Mario reaches specific levels. Not only does your audience grow, but the stage also changes as you rise in the ranks, adding random effects that can either help or harm Mario and enemies. I find that these get in the way more often than not, especially the fog effect that makes both sides of the battle less accurate, which is just annoying. Finally, there's the bingo roulette, which can give you a huge boost if you're lucky enough to get it. You need to activate the first two bingo slots by pulling off an action command, and if those two panels match, you get to roll for the third slot to try and get it to match the previous two. If you do, you'll fully restore HP, FP, and or SP, and will gain a huge amount of audience members, unless you hit the dreaded poison mushroom roll, which I've thankfully never done. With all these additions and refinements, TTYD's battle system marks a significant improvement over the combat in Paper Mario, tightening up mechanics that were slow and clunky and making it more of a spectacle. I don't want to play my hand too quickly on this, as I still haven't finished the last three games in the franchise yet, but I think it may be fair to say this is the best battle system in the series. Again, I'm not committing to this, but despite the combat still being very simple compared to other RPGs, it maintains the level of strategy you had at your disposal in Paper Mario while fine-tuning the game to make it feel smoother overall. Just like last time, Mario will meet and recruit a couple of partners on his quests that will help him out in battle and on the overworld. The supporting cast is a little more diverse this time, with more attention on their traits and backstories, making them stand out more as characters. And in battle, they have more importance. I already mentioned how partners have their own HP gauge now, and when you put a partner in front, they stay there, making them more likely to be targeted. But how do they stack up as companions? Gumbella is certainly a better partner than Gumbario because she actually has a personality that isn't just hello, I am tutorial person. She's a sassy, take no crap Goomba who is also a university student, so already she makes more of an impact as a foil to Mario and has a story justification as to how she knows about everything you can tattle on. In battle, she carries over the head bonk, tattle, and multi bonk abilities from Gumbario, but swaps out his charge for Rally Wink, which allows Mario to take an extra turn, giving her a welcome supportive edge. Likewise, Koops adapts Cooper's moveset and playstyle, including his overworld shell tossing ability, and brings a shy, socially awkward character alongside it. Koops joins Mario so he can become stronger like his father and conquer his anxieties, despite the protests of his girlfriend Koopa Koo, which may be a simple character arc, but it works. He's more defensive than Cooper, with higher defense but lower HP, and in addition to throwing himself at enemies, he can also use his shell shield move to put a barrier on top of Mario, protecting him from damage. From here, we get more unique partners like the Wind Spirit Madame Fleury, who certainly has an... interesting design. Personally, I've never been a fan of her character, as her high society and slightly snobbish attitude isn't my cup of tea, not to mention her sprite, which just doesn't gel with me. She's a more supportive partner, because while she can attack with a body slam, she can also blow enemies away with Gale Force, steal enemy HP with Lip Lock, and make Mario more likely to dodge with Dodgy Fog. Not a bad partner, but pretty low on my totem pole, though she does make for a good shield. 
In Chapter 3, you'll find a weird egg that hatches into a baby Yoshi with a brash, energetic personality who has a different color depending on how long he takes to hatch and whom you can name whatever you want. I'll be referring to him as Yoshi for this video, but regardless, you can ride on him to gain extra speed and he can hover for a short time, making traveling through larger areas much more tolerable. Yoshi is probably my favorite partner in battle, as his gulp move does wonders for hurting enemies with high defense and for clearing out multiple enemies at once. His ground pound and mini egg moves are okay, but Stampede is great when you have a couple of weaker enemies to clear out. I only wish Vivian were as helpful in combat, because while her fire-based moves are okay, they never feel particularly helpful unless it's against ice-based monsters, which aren't very common. And for some reason Veil, vale, which should perform identically to bows out of sight, becomes practically useless as enemies will attack you anyway if Mario goes first, making it almost entirely situational. Which is a shame because her story arc is definitely the most compelling. She starts out as a member of the Shadow Sirens, a recurring boss battle for Mario and the gang, who is constantly tormented by the other two because they see her as a failure, usually for reasons that aren't her fault. When she joins up with Mario after he loses his identity in Chapter 4, she realizes that Mario is the only one who's treated her kindly and decides to become his partner for good, which is an endearing storyline. And before we move on, I do want to briefly discuss Vivian's gender and how it was lost in localization. In the Japanese text, Vivian is a transgender woman picked on by Bedlam, who refers to her with male pronouns in an aggressive, taunting way. But when others refer to her, only the Italian version explicitly calls her a trans female, as the Japanese, Spanish, and French localizations refer to her as a boy who looks like a girl, and the English and German translations omit any reference to her trans status and just call her a female. Now we're not going to go into a discussion of gender identity here, I'll just say that I find it a shame that her gender was handled so carelessly in translation. I understand this game came out in a time before trans issues and representation were really talked about seriously, but it does make Vivian's character a somewhat lost opportunity. Moving on, to get to Chapter 5, Mario must recruit Admiral Bobbery, a former sea captain whose wife died of an illness while he was at sea, which filled him with such regret that he locked himself away, never to sail again. He's another enjoyable character, as you learn about his past and teach him to embrace the life of the sea again, and he has a pretty cool design. He takes over Bombette's role with his bomb and bombast move blowing up enemies, though he can also throw out miniature bombs that explode in time with Bomb Squad and hold fast to deal revenge damage to enemies that attack him, neither of which I find very useful. While I do think Bombette is better offensively because she's strictly focused on bombing, Bobbery is an adequate substitute. That's it for the main partners, but you can also enlist the help of an optional partner by talking to Miss Mouse. She's a badge thief who you occasionally meet in the storyline, and by completing her side quests, she'll become a member of your team. She can sniff out hidden items in the overworld, and in battle, you can use her to steal items or badges from enemies, make your foes dizzy, or replenish Mario's health. Unfortunately, she suffers heavily in the HP and offense department, and honestly, I don't like using her in combat. She rarely brings anything to the table that the other partners don't already have. I'd say the partners are about as useful in TTYD as they were in the N64 game, but with their better story arcs and personalities, they stick out much more in my mind and are more entertaining to watch. You could say that's because I have much more nostalgia for this game and played it a lot more than Paper Mario growing up, but regardless, this is a very good cast even if not all of them are super useful in battle. But if there's anything in TTYD that I can always get lost in, it's the aesthetics, because this game looks and sounds great. It continues the Papercraft visual style from Paper Mario while polishing it with the graphical capabilities of the 6th generation to get away from the blocky sprite look of the N64 characters. And the characters look fantastic, with expressive faces, unique outfits and color schemes that help them stick out, and high quality renders. The setting has a more home-constructed feel to it, as if the locations you visit are models made of paper, cardboard, and wood, which ties in nicely with the stage theme of the battle system. In many ways, it reminds me a lot of Super Mario Bros. 3 and how the game's levels appear to be built as a play in a theater, which is taken to the next level here with a full-fledged audience watching the production. But for me, it's the color choices that really make the world of TTYD shine, especially when the game goes for a more abstract or stylized setting. Many levels go for a more traditional Mario mood and look, emphasizing bright colors that are designed to pop visually, but sometimes TTYD shows us locations that look downright stunning. 
On an aesthetics level, I personally love the Bogley Woods with its gorgeous black and white with rainbow accents color scheme and Twilight Town with a heavy emphasis on purple and brown that looks bleak and downtrodden but still, in a way, quite nice to look at. Yuka Sujioko returned to compose the music, this time joined by Origami King composer Yoshito Sekigawa and Fire Emblem sound composer Saki Kasuga to help bring the soundtrack to life. And they did a fantastic job. They maintain the same bouncy, cheery style of Paper Mario's music and branch out into a bunch of different fields, experimenting with genre and tone to make some truly unique audio. The instrument and sample selection is more avant-garde than the typical Mario sound font, escaping reliance on traditional instruments and bringing in a bunch of weird synths and noises that enhance the compositions. I won't say that every single song works, but many of these tunes make for an absolutely killer background note as you play through the game. Unfortunately, I can't extend that praise to the battle theme, which, after so many years, I think is wearing out its welcome for me. I just find the song to be more annoying than it is invigorating, and the instruments used here aren't really to my liking. Again, the main battle theme is something I like looking at in RPGs, and thankfully the boss battle themes are much better, especially for the Hooktail, Macho Grubba, and final boss fights. In addition to beefing up the aesthetics, the developers also significantly increased their attention on crafting an original narrative. The first game played it very safe with the overall concept, going back to the familiar Bowser Kidnaps Peach plot, but TTYD bounces off of this in an attempt to tell a more in-depth story. It's still about an evil organization who kidnaps Princess Peach while Mario rescues her, but with more dialogue and character interaction this time, it's a significant step ahead of the simpler narrative from the previous game. As with Paper Mario, the main story is chiefly communicated in the interludes between segments while each chapter tells its own self-contained narrative centered around the locations and characters within. The homeworld is the town of Rogueport, a den of thieves and crooks that is much less of a friendly town than Toad Town from Paper Mario. The characters here are more unsavory than the ones you encountered in the last game, and Rogueport itself is very rundown and filthy, indicating that the town is in a constant state of disrepair. That's a nice thematic touch, especially considering how this is supposed to be the new Rogueport, but looks no better than the old town of Rogueport sewers, even if it is a little more lively than the world below. This hub world is more condensed than Toad Town, featuring fewer rooms above ground and a less confusing to navigate underground section. While it doesn't have the homey vibe of the last game's main hub, I still find Rogueport an interesting setting because of how disheveled and grimy it is. I mean, there's literally a gallows in the center of town, and the implication that Rogueport executes people in public is a gruesome detail for a Mario game, and honestly, I love it. After receiving the location of the first Crystal Star, Professor Frankly sends Mario and Gumbella off to Petal Meadows, a normally peaceful grassland inhabited by Koopas, which is currently being tormented by the dragon Hooktail, whose castle rests on the edge of the field. After recruiting the timid Koops to his party, Mario sets off for Hooktail Castle to defeat the dragon and rescue Koops' dad, who left to defeat Hooktail long ago but never returned. Petal Meadows acts as the basic introductory level, as the graphics are bright and colorful, the music is jaunty, and the dungeon has a more regal and light-hearted atmosphere. It's a good chapter to start with, and while it is simple compared to what later parts bring, it makes sense to ease into the game with this chapter. I've already complimented Chapter 2's visuals, and it really does look incredible, but sadly, I can't extend that praise to the rest of the chapter. Not only does the backtracking issue rear its ugly head hard in here, but there's also the escort mission that takes up a large part of this section. Mario needs to help the Punies, a race of mouse-like creatures who have been imprisoned by the x knots in their home, the Great Boggly Tree. He enlists Madame Fleury to get inside, and once he frees the Punies, they tag along with him throughout the remainder of the chapter. The Punies follow you and activate switches to help you progress, but they're easily frightened by enemies and can fall off of high places, forcing you to hunt for them or gather them back at the entrance of the tree. 
It's just not fun to deal with, and not helping is the Punies theme, an annoying, headache-inducing tune, replacing the Great Boggly Tree theme, a mellow and beautiful song that's one of my favorites on the soundtrack once you recruit them, which I'm not exactly happy about. Chapter 3 is interesting because it deliberately moves away from the typical Paper Mario level formula in favor of a story surrounding a professional fighting ring that Mario takes part in. When Mario heads up to the City in the Sky Glitzville, he finds that the Crystal Star is apparently the prize for the champion of the Glitz Pit and is currently in the hands of undefeated fighter Rock Hawk. To get the belt, Mario signs up for the Fighting League under the name of the Great Gonzales and battles to the top of the rankings, while also uncovering the dark secrets behind the ring, including why fighters go missing and what Glitz Pit manager Grubba and his assistant Jolene are hiding. This chapter has no enemies to encounter in the field. Every battle is initiated by the player, and per the Glitz Pit rules, Mario must fulfill a specified condition in each match to advance in the rankings, such as not jumping, not using items, or appealing to the crowd. This chapter has really good pacing, moving between fighting and story segments very well, and the mystery of the Glitz Pit is genuinely interesting and fun to solve, making this probably my favorite part of the game. And then you have chapter 4, certainly the worst part of the game. Mario and his friends travel to the dark and gloomy Twilight Town, whose residents are cursed to turn into pigs whenever the bells of the nearby creepy steeple ring, and to break the curse, Mario heads to the steeple and confronts the trickster ghost Dupless. It seems at first that Mario does this with ease, getting the Crystal Star in no time, but in reality, Dupless steals Mario's name and looks, and with his partners fooled, Mario is left alone to head back to Twilight Town. It's here where Mario encounters a sad Vivian and persuades her to help him retrieve his identity, which involves them learning Dupless's name and reciting it back to him in a very Rumpelstiltskin manner. Out of all the chapters, this one requires the most walking back and forth between locations to finish, as you have to travel from one edge of the map to the other no less than three different times to advance the story. And this is a linear level with no shortcuts to make the journey between the town and the steeple any quicker, and since you lose access to Yoshi for a big chunk of this chapter, it's slow as hell to boot. I mean, this chapter looks great. Again, I love the dark foreboding colors in the town and forest, but playing through it is absolutely no fun. After that, Mario needs to head to the southern island of Keel Hall Key to get the fifth Crystal Star, which requires him to assemble a ship and crew, led by the gloating shipmaster Flavio and Admiral Bobbery. Suddenly, ghost pirates attack the crew and cause them to shipwreck on Keel Hall Key, leaving them stranded with no way to leave, but thankfully, Mario is able to find the pirate's grotto where the Crystal Star is located. Chapter 5 isn't bad, and is certainly a welcome change of pace over the misery of Chapter 4, but it still lacks for me in terms of excitement. It still has that backtracking problem, I don't find the setting super interesting, and most of the intriguing narrative happens before this section even begins when you're trying to convince Bobbery to join you. But at least the Cortez fight is awesome, one of my favorites in the game because it's a good challenge that requires precise but not impossible timing and pattern recognition to super guard everything. Chapter 6 is a really cool part of the game when you play it for the first time, and then every time afterwards it's a tedious, uninteresting slog. The sixth crystal star is in Poshley Heights, which conveniently is only a pleasant three-day train ride away. Of course, it isn't that simple, as Mario and the other passengers deal with mysterious occurrences on the way, including stolen items, a threat to blow off the train, and an encounter with these monsters known as the Smorg. Like Chapter 3, there's no encounters here until you reach Riverside Station and Poshley Sanctum, and those areas aren't the bulk of the adventure. Instead, most of the chapter concerns Mario interacting with the other passengers and assisting the Detective Pennington in solving their troubles. When you don't know how the story will progress, it's more tolerable, but this chapter has barely anything if you're replaying it like me, though I will say, the music in this chapter is outstanding. The penultimate chapter, Chapter 7, sees Mario making it to the x naught base on the moon where Peach is being held in order to reclaim the crystal star that the group has in their possession. In order to get there, the team heads to Far Outpost to activate a cannon to launch into space, but the native bob won't let them use it without permission from two high-ranking officials, Gold Bob and General White. Getting Gold Bob's approval isn't difficult, but anyone who's played TTYD probably shuddered when I mentioned General White, and for good reason. See, no one knows where General White is, and to find him, you need to talk to a chain of people who say that you just missed a general and point you in the direction of where you need to go, only to reveal that General White has gone back to Far Outpost while you were hunting for him. 
By this point, you've probably unlocked the shortcut pipes in Rogueport sewers to make traveling to each location quicker, but the fact that you have to do this in the first place when the quest ends where you begin just sucks, and the joke of this section doesn't justify it. Which is a shame, because the X-Not base is a decently fun dungeon that does make Chapter 7 feel a bit better. It's laid out in a way that makes it easy to remember where to go next, despite many of the floors looking similar to each other, and it's cool visiting locations we previously saw in the Peach segments. As I mentioned earlier, after each chapter, the game goes into an interlude where you see what's happening with Peach and Bowser. By talking to Tech, Peach learns that the Exnauts seek to take over the world by opening the treasure behind the Thousand Year Door, which contains the soul of a demon that can bring ruin to the world. Unfortunately, the ex nots learn that Tech is feeding Peach information and shut him down, and when you visit his room as Mario in Chapter 7, he uses the last of his power to open the way out for the heroes. Peach sometimes explores the ex not base to collect information for Tech, but most of the time it's just conversations with the two or a short little minigame like the dancing sequence or the obligatory Paper Mario quiz. The Peach segments are fine, but I feel that it doesn't go far enough in exploring the relationship between Peach and Tech, or Tech's questioning of his orders, so these portions are more exposition than anything. The Bowser interludes are purely there for comedy, and they're great. Sometimes you control Bowser in a side-scrolling style reminiscent of the original Super Mario Bros., where the platforming feels a little too rigid, and while I love the idea of Bowser going through a level as Mario would, I am glad these sections are brief. But I love Bowser's characterization here, as he's portrayed as an impatient doofus who's constantly let down by the incompetence of his crew and his inability to keep up with Mario. He'll visit locations you've already been to, and while he always gets there too late, he does meet up with characters Mario and the gang encountered. Even though there's no new story development here, you get to see what's happening with the characters and locations you met during the chapters, which makes the Bowser interludes a really fun addition. And on the topic of fun additions, let's cover the extra content you can do before we wrap up discussing the main quest. Rogueport contains a number of side quests and minigames that you can tackle if you want to take a break from the main story, some of which return from Paper Mario, and others which are brand new. Hunting for star pieces, which you give to Dazzle to once again buy exclusive badges, including that quick change badge I mentioned in the last video, and finding recipes for the more irritable chef Zesty are both back and serve the same function as before. After Chapter 3, Mario can also return to the Glitz Pits and continue fighting as the Great Gonzalez, starting back from the minor leagues and working your way up to become the champ again. There are also some new games to spend your coins on, such as the Happy Lucky Lottery, a lottery drawing that lets you check the numbers every day according to your GameCube's internal clock. Contrary to what you might think, this event isn't random, as you will win the grand prize eventually after enough time passes. You just need to wait about a year to do it if you don't feel like advancing the clock manually. There's also the Pianta Parlor, which, in addition to having slots, also contains minigames that require your paper abilities to win. You exchange coins for Pianta tokens to play these games, and you can cash those tokens in for prizes, but honestly, while some of the games are fun, it doesn't take long for me to get bored in the parlor. You know what isn't boring? Listening to Luigi talking about his adventures. Yes, unlike Paper Mario where he was just lazing around at home, Luigi actually goes on his own adventure in parallel to Mario's where he must save Princess Eclaire by finding the seven pieces of the Marvelous Compass. At various points in the game, you can ask Luigi how his quest is going, and while Mario and his partners don't find them that interesting, I love hearing Luigi boast about his accomplishments and then turning to his partners and hearing them describe what actually happened. Beyond this, there's the two major pieces of side content that most players are familiar with, the Trouble Center and the Pit of 100 Trials. The Trouble Center is a building in Rogueport where people can request someone to help them with a task that Mario can take on. Tasks vary depending on the recipient, but most involve finding the right item to bring to them or getting something from another NPC, but this unfortunately means a lot of walking between locations, adding to TTYD's already egregious padding problem. And even though multiple troubles unlock at once, you can only do one at a time, adding to the amount of walking you need to do if you go for them all. Finally, there's the Pit of 100 Trials, a gauntlet of fights that Mario must complete without any breaks for healing to collect some unique prizes. This is where the game's most challenging enemies lie, but I'll admit that I've actually never gone very far in this area. I just don't find the prospect of doing a bunch of turn-based fights in a row enthralling enough to see it through all the way, even if some of the rewards are very nice. 
Anyway, with all the crystal stars in hand, Mario and his crew head back to the Thousand Year Door and open it up to ensure that the demon soul doesn't fall into the hands of the x knots Behind the Thousand Year Door lies the Palace of Shadow, an extensive stretch of corridors and chambers that almost looks like it goes on forever. It's a sprawling world that contains a bunch of tough enemies, including a number of boss fights, and it's also the most puzzle-heavy section. Midway through the chapter, you'll come across the Tower of Riddles, a building containing puzzle rooms that require you to use your partner's abilities to solve the most complex puzzles in the game. After beating the Shadow Sirens, Hooktail's brother Gloomtail, Grotus, and Bowser and Kami Koopa, Mario finally makes it to the treasure room of the Palace of Shadow, where Peach and Grotus are waiting. Grotus planned to lure Mario into opening the Thousand Year Door so that he could take Peach into the inner chamber, where he then unseals the locks that bind the demon, a creature known as the Shadow Queen. The Shadow Queen requires a vessel to regain her strength, which is why Grotus needed Peach to see his plan through, but when Grotus attempts to control the Shadow Queen, she blasts him into smithereens. Then, Bedlam reveals herself to be the true mastermind behind this plot, and with her newfound power, the Shadow Queen plunges the world into darkness and engages Mario for the final fight. This battle takes place over three phases, the first where you fight a possessed Princess Peach, the second where she turns invulnerable but the heroes break her defenses through the power of plot, and then the actual boss fight where you defeat the Shadow Queen in her true form. The Peach form isn't that bad, but the true form can be fairly challenging if you don't have enough healing items in stock. The Shadow Queen can charge her attack to devastating proportions and spawn hands that drain your HP or deal damaging multi-hit attacks. As long as you avoid the super deadly moves or have the recovery items to bounce back from them, you should make it out okay, but it can feel like a battle of attrition more than a climactic final fight. When Mario defeats the Shadow Queen, she is sealed back into her prison, this time for good, and Peach wakes up fully in control of her body again. With the world saved, Mario and Peach say goodbye to the partners and head back to the Mushroom Kingdom, ending the Thousand Year Door. And man, what a journey it is. If I didn't already make this clear, I love the Thousand Year Door, and even playing it 17 years after its release, I can still say it's an amazing time. The numerous gameplay additions and refinements make this a more exciting game than the original, and while I appreciate the first game's simplicity, T2ID took the foundation and ran with it, usually succeeding. For me, and I'm sure for other people who grew up with the 5th and 6th generation consoles, this was my first example of a Mario game going beyond the boundaries that I expected from the series. I did keep a critical eye when playing this game, mind you, as I wanted to give it an honest assessment that looked for the game's flaws, and I'll be the first to admit, this game isn't perfect. Some new features are more annoying or ruin the flow, there's a lot more backtracking and padding compared to Paper Mario, and overall, it makes more questionable design choices than the first game. But in my view, the things the game does right, especially regarding the dialogue, combat, and aesthetics, more than outweigh the negatives. I realize a lot of Paper Mario fans who favor the later games and didn't grow up with this one tend to look down on it, and hey, if you don't like this game or think it's overrated, that's absolutely fine, I'm not going to criticize that. Again, the point of this retrospective isn't to emphasize one style over another, but to examine these games from a critical perspective and celebrate the series, even when the game does things I don't like. And despite TTYD doing some things I don't like, it's still a fantastic game that brings me back to the same magical experiences I had when I first played it, and it will always have a special place in my heart.